Um, the, the main topic here is about um, how to raise money to finance your portfolio. So we came up with a model that we worked almost mirrors what happens in the US, which is that to write a mortgage, we have the licenses, so Ghana Home Loans or now GHL Bank will write the mortgage, originate the mortgage. We fund that mortgage using a bridging finance from a bank. But before we do that, we would have already negotiated a long-term facility, for example, with OPEC for, say, $10 million. But because you can't go to OPEC to draw down 50,000, 10,000, 50,000 every time, what we've done is to arrange a bridging facility with Stambik Bank or Carl Bank in Ghana. We draw on that facility, and when it gets to about, say, $5 million, we then go to the long-term provider to come and replenish it. So that's the basic financing model that we use, short-term financing and a long-term uh, top-up. In that whole arrangement, there are several rules that we play. So there is obviously the originator, which is ourselves. There is the bridging finance provider. There's also a paying agent. Because we were not a bank, we could not get payments into our account straight away. What we did was to establish an account with, more often, the bridging finance provider. So all the people who take mortgages from us make repayments to that account. What that does is to guarantee the long-term fund provider that their collateral is safe because our collateral to them is the underlying mortgage that we have written. We don't use our balance sheet. We had a very light balance sheet. In fact, at the time, we had shareholders funds of about $3 million, but we had uh, facilities of about $60 million. You know, nobody's going to give you that. But we were able to do that because we collateralized the mortgages we'd written, the receivables from those mortgages, to the long-term provider. And by doing so, you need what we call a collateral agent. A collateral agent is the one who actually holds the security on behalf of the long-term financier. So, th so there, these people, so imagine you being the long-term lender to GHL, and then you say, okay, the collateral for my loan is held by an independent person who verifies that it meets the type of collateral that I want. And then you also have somebody who receives all the monies on your behalf and actually pays you before the residual is paid to GHL Bank. That gives assurance. So th that's really what we have used to fund our, our, our mortgages. And so there's a collateral agent, there is a paying agent, and of course, as the originator and the bridging finance provider. It's all sort of depicted in this graph uh, that is here. So Ghana Home Loans, the originator, and of course the servicer, because the long-term provider isn't gonna be servicing the loans. It's not gonna be chasing people when they, when, 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 when they default. So GHL Bank retains the role of the originator and the servicer. And the paying agent, so the warehouse provider there is the short-term bridging financier that I mentioned, who funds us, and then we take the long-term uh, uh, funder to pay them off. The borrower makes their monthly payments to the paying agent. The paying agent pays, pays the uh, long-term lender, which is all that way, and then the residual, which is the interest, because we may borrow at about, say, 7%, but lend at 12%. So the residual has to be paid back to us for us to run our business. Um, I can stop here for questions if anyone wants, because otherwise it's going to be gone. Any clarifications on this particular point? But that's really why I'm supposed to be speaking here. No question? OK, this one. Um, in, my name is Emmanuel from FMDQ, Nigeria. Um, in terms of success stories, can you put numbers to this? Can I put numbers? Yeah. Right. Okay. So we have, as I mentioned earlier, we've lent to about 5,000 individuals. We have actually raised about 210 million US dollars and deployed that 210 million dollars. We still have about, um, we have raised close to 80 million dollars that would hopefully be dispersed within the next uh, six months. Any question on that? Yeah. Okay. The bridging finance. Uh, how this crypto cross? Uh, the bridging finance. In theor theoretically, it's expensive, but how do you uh, deliver affordability? Affordability. Yeah, to the household, because you get a bridging finance from a bank, and yeah. you've got a long-term. Um, Financier. What's uh, for the us, difference? The pricing is about the same. Um, so 
typically the long-term funder will be looking for about, say, 7%. The short-term funder will be looking for maybe 8 or 9% because they're generally a local bank um, and so likely to be more expensive than the offshore uh, financier. And we write the mortgages at about 12%. So, yes, we do lose some of the margin during the period at which it is with the uh, bridging financier. We do now, we do now, and we did that really to be involved in the value chain because we found that the developers were not building to scale, um, which, of course, if they don't build to scale, then we don't have properties to write our mortgages on. But by being a bank, we can now channel funds to the developers and make sure they go to exactly who, who um, uh, uh, the, the payments are intended to. Yeah. Sorry? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but forgive my ignorance. I'm curious about the policy rate in Ghana. Sorry, what is the? The policy rate. So, okay, that's another thing. So the, we don't lend in local currency as much as we do in foreign currency. Okay. Um, in terms of interest rates in Ghana, the policy rate is about 16%, but the lending rate in cities would be as high as 26%. Whereas in uh, USD, we're able to bring it down to 12%. And the reason we do that is why we lend in uh, dollars is pretty simple. One, Ghana is a very dollarized economy. I don't know for those who've been there, your hotel, your car hire, everything is in dollars anyway. So we're very dollarized. We can't do more than five years in, uh, in cities, but we can do up to 20 years in dollars. So that brings the repayments down, that brings the repayment to income down, and that's why we sort of do a lot more of our loans in, in dollars. But we do offer people the opportunity to take a city loan. Anyone? Okay. Uh, from FNB. Um, does that not close out um, a significant uh, number of people if you are lending out in, in dollars? It does, but as I said, that is a very dollarized economy. That's the first thing, and so people are able to cope. There's no doubt that our market till date has been between the 30,000 to about $80,000 property. Um, we have found that you know any property below 30,000 may not necessarily deliver something that somebody will be committed to paying for for 15 years in terms of infrastructure and everything else. Um, there are not many high-rise buildings, which obviously increases the, uh, decreases the property price. A lot of people want to be on the flatland, uh, one floor. And so the cheapest property you find in the market, cheapest, cheapest decent property that you found in the market will be about 30,000. USD. USD, yeah. And real estate is all in USD. As long as is provided by a developer. It's always priced in USD. Okay, okay so um, that is the structure of the funding. Uh, and and uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is all based on arrangements and agreements. And some of those agreements are those I've put up there, which is the obviously the most obvious one is the mortgage agreement between ourselves and the borrower. There's the paying agent agreement that is between ourselves, the borrower, sorry, between ourselves, the long-term lender, and a bank, there's a collateral agents agreement. And the collateral agent really does two things. In fact, more than two. One is to ensure that the loan that we've written and pledged to the long-term funder meets the criteria that we agreed with that long-term funder. Because the long-term funder determines the type of loans we write. So you might find that you find a long-term debt provider who might say, I don't want to finance a loan that is more than $50,000, right? So the collateral agent will be the one who ensures that the collateral we're pledging is within that criteria. And beyond that, they also um, are actually almost like a, uh, we, we name them as a beneficiary of an insurance policy. So when someone dies, they're the ones who get the money and then pay the, uh, uh, the long-term fund provider. Um, some of the institutions that we've dealt with um, are here, FMO, OPIC, Standard Bank, um, well, we, all, we know all of these, and hopefully very soon we shall add the uh, African Development Bank to it, um, and, and many other institutions that, that, that we've worked with. But these have been our core backers. Uh, these are the guys who have given us the more than $200 million that we've used to write our mortgages over the last uh, 12 years. So what are the key takeaways? Um, well, it's there. You, before you, you've got to do your research. Um, you saw the slide before. We identified these institutions as the institutions that are prepared to fund uh, mortgages. Um, so we went to them with a business plan. We made sure we had the right team. So it was a combination of myself, who was 
private equity investor, another person who was uh, a capital markets player and a mortgage player. So you've got to make sure that you really create a, a team that knows what they're talking about. Otherwise, you really can't have, you can't raise $200 million with an equity base of about $5, $10 million. You really have to get it right for them. Um, I'll put it there, don't be greedy. Um, you've got to start by sharing a lot of your upside, and then as time goes on, you decrease that, right? Um, we're very transparent in the way we process our mortgages and treat our collateral, and that is really important. You know, that whole separation of functions from the originator to the paying agent to the collateral agent um, uh, is, is really important. And what we find with funders is that, you know, the housekeeping is actually more important than anything else which is make sure your, your reports go in in time. You know, make sure you've got a very, very strong reporting function. Submit your reports in time. Always be ready for due diligence. We started in 2006, and every year we've had to have either two or three financiers doing due diligence on us. But we find that it takes about 12, year, uh, 12 months from when you engage a new lender to when they disperse, and sometimes even more. So at any point in time, you should be prepared for for due diligence, so we have a shared point that we just literally send out to anyone who's interested in us to say, here, here you are, you have our reports. We can give you the monthly report since 2006 to last month. And that's because we have a very, very strong uh, well, reporting culture and documentation, maintenance of documentation as well. Um, and of course, one of the things that we find to our advantage is that don't hide a problem. If you have a problem, share it, because you're not the first one and only one to have that problem. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that we have found, that people always um, try to not give the bad news. But bad news has got to be shared. At some stage, it's going to come out anyway. So it'd be the first to tell them rather than them finding out. That's it. Thank you very much for, your, for listening to me. <laughs> one question, maybe. OK. Thank you so much for, for, for sharing your business. Yeah. Present yourself and go to the question. Quick. Okay. Twambo Hamsute is my name from Zambian Home Loans. Okay. Thank you so much for sharing. My question relates to your product. So you, you, you lend in US dollars. Yeah. Are all your customers earning US dollar salaries? Or you are lending U.S. dollars to people who are earning local currency as well? Yeah, so about 40% of those who borrow from us uh, and uh, U.S. dollars or foreign currency, effectively. And if they don't, a few proportion of those also have salaries that are linked to the dollar but paid in local currency. But what we've actually found is that, um, okay, again, I said you've got to look at the macros in Ghana, which is a very dollarized economy where salary adjustments always reflect the depreciation in the currency in that year. And so uh, people are able to cope. But what we've actually found, strangely, is that the CD component or the CD borrowers of our portfolio perform better than the USD ones. Um, one, because the CD borrowers often go for a much lower priced property. They are more likely to be in the lower income segment, and as I mentioned earlier, more committed to their mortgage obligations. Whereas the dollarized earners, sometimes we question why they're coming to borrow from us, because they could borrow from elsewhere, especially those who live abroad. The initial business plan was, to, was around 60% um, offshore Ghanaians and then 40% Ghanaians, but it's actually been flipped the other way around, where it's about 80% local Ghanaians and 20% outside. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you for uh, that presentation, which is very useful. I like your uh, uh, last slide where you put in things like don't be greedy on the first negotiation, so I hope you not to be greedy on the subsequent ones either. Um, <laughs> well, you please, gotta, but, but, greed is good. <laughs> but really, what is, what, what is the transparency you're talking about on collateral management? Isn't that already ordinarily transparent? No. Um, what you find is that most uh, mortgage finance institutions, actually, because they write, they keep the collateral themselves. Um, they, they um, yes, you can go through and have a very good collateral, but if you don't have an independent person and you've got a lender who's not in country, they're sitting there saying, is this guy telling me the truth that 
the 20 million portfolio that is given to me meets the criteria that uh, I had given him, that the collateral itself even exists, right? So, it's imp so that's the assurance that they get that we lived by the eligibility rules that we all agreed to. The collateral has been created. The collateral package, which includes the loan agreement, copies of the land title, and all of those have actually been given and stored by the collateral agent. So for example, if, if GHL goes bust, they can appoint another bank to just run the portfolio for them. Thank you. Well, that was the last question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. That's for you. So I'm calling. So this will be the last session of the morning. So Mrs. Dr. Shi Akporji, again. And Mrs. Mr. Mr. Olivier Assi, Monsieur Olivier Assier de Fonjari, de, donc Dr. Shi Akporji de la Caisse de refinancement hypothécaire du, du Nigeria, et Monsieur Olivier Asler de Fonjarim au Maroc et en Tunisie. Oh, est que, is there a moderator? There is a moderator. You have a presentation? Yes, I do. Okay, so. Okay. You do? I have Dr. Shi, you have a presentation? I see. No. Do you want to start? As you wish. All right. <laughs> to show me how to... Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. 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 Bonjour à tous. Il y a un, un, un proverbe en français qui dit euh, « Vente affamée n'a pas d'oreille euh, ». J'espère que ce n'est pas tout à fait le cas encore, malgré l'heure du déjeuner qui approche. Euh, je, euh, donc on on m'a demandé, euh, Kessia et euh, Olivier Villal notamment, de, de, de présenter euh, de, les cas de fonds de garantie pour les emprunteurs du secteur informel, euh, qui sont évidemment une grande partie de la population dans beaucoup de pays. C'est notamment le cas euh, dans la, la sous-région euh, UMOA, euh, où à peu près 75% en général des ménages... Euh, sont, appartiennent au secteur informel. Or, ce sont des gens qui sont, d'une part, ils peuvent être solvables, et deuxièmement, qui ont des besoins en logement. Donc, euh, euh, malgré les difficultés de prêter à ces euh, catégories, il est important d'amener euh, la, la disponibilité de crédit au logement dans ce secteur. Alors, ma, ma, ma présentation que... <coughs> J'ai mis beaucoup d'informations, mais je vais devoir sauter pas mal pour concentrer sur quelques messages essentiels, pour ne pas trop retarder le déroulement du programme. Je vais d'abord parler brièvement de la position de ces mécanismes dans la politique de financement du logement. Deuxièmement, je vais m'apesantir sur le cas du dispositif au Maroc, Fogarim, qui est un peu une référence en la matière, et présenter brièvement le nouveau fonds de garantie en Tunisie, qui est tout récent, donc il n'est pas encore opérationnel. Et puis enfin, troisième partie, je vais donner quelques enseignements un peu plus généraux à partir de ces exemples. Alors, premier point, si j'arrive à faire marcher cet outil, euh, je voudrais... Euh, simplement calibrer, enfin plutôt euh, positionner, il y a beaucoup de produits d'assurance en liaison avec le crédit au logement, et donc je voudrais simplement déblayer le, le sujet. Il euh, euh, y a, y a, y a des, des systèmes de garantie qui protègent les emprunteurs, euh, par exemple euh, contre les aléas de la vie, euh, le chômage, etc. C'est évidemment pas de ça qu que l'on va parler. Il y a des assurances ou des garanties qui, prêtent, qui prêtent, protègent les investisseurs, 
euh, assurance de portefeuille, euh, euh, monoline pour la titrisation. Ce n'est pas non plus le sujet. Et puis, il y a des euh, systèmes d'assurance ou de garantie euh, qui, eux, prétègent les prêteurs, donc qui diminuent le risque des, des prêteurs euh, immobiliers. Alors, il y a deux grandes catégories, dans, à, mon, à mon sens. Il y a les systèmes ou les dispositifs d'assurance un peu à l'anglo-saxonne euh, qui sont fondés sur le critère de quotité, euh, LTV en anglais, donc euh, les, les fortes quotités présentant plus de risques, euh, il y a des assurances pour, pour ça. Et puis il y a euh, un autre mécanisme, ce sont les fonds de garantie à but plutôt social qui donc euh, protègent le risque lié à des populations vulnérables, bas revenus ou euh, secteur informel. Et ça, ce sont les fonds de garantie qui sont en général, bien entendu, baqués par les États. C'est de, de ça dont on va parler. Euh, alors, l'intérêt potentiel ou le bénéfice de ces, de ces systèmes, c'est effectivement, d'une part, d'ouvrir de, de l'accès au crédit à logement à des populations qui en sont normalement exclues parce que les, les prêteurs traditionnels ne savent pas leur prêter, ne, ne savent mal apprécier le risque. Euh, deuxièmement, c'est un avantage pour les, euh, les États eux-mêmes parce que, euh, au lieu de, euh, que les budgets publics financent euh, les, euh, les crédits ou les constructions, ils mobilisent en fait du crédit. Donc euh, l'État va sans doute euh, faire une sorte de subvention à travers le fonds de garantie, mais euh, la ressource viendra essentiellement du système bancaire. Euh, le troisième, euh, le troisième impact ou bénéfice important, c'est d'une part euh, d'élargir euh, le champ d'action du système bancaire. Donc euh, c'est très intéressant pour les, tout, tout, tous les prêteurs, mais en même temps renforcer la stabilité en les prémunissant contre des risques un peu spécifiques. Voilà. Et euh, dernier point, quand on construit ce genre de dispositif, il est intéressant toujours de voir ce qui marche ou ce qui ne marche pas dans d'autres pays. Alors, le Maroc, euh, donc le Maroc, euh, là aussi, je passe très très vite, euh, surtout pour, euh, euh, surtout pour euh, insister sur le fait qu'il y a eu un changement de politique du financement du logement au Maroc euh, euh, vers 2004-2005, où la, la politique de subvention à la demande euh, a été remplacée par une politique de subvention à l'offre. Donc ce sont les développeurs, les promoteurs qui sont aidés maintenant. Et les subventions qui étaient autrefois données aux ménages ont été remplacées précisément par des systèmes de garantie. Alors, il y a quand même, comme ça va avoir un impact sur ce que je vais dire plus tard, je précise qu'il y a deux grands programmes avec une aide du côté de l'offre. Il y a un premier programme pour la classe qu'on dirait en anglais « low middle income », donc revenu moyen mais quand même assez faible, et puis un programme pour les gens les plus modestes, euh, notamment qui s'occupe, enfin qui aide euh, les anciens bidonvillois, les slum dwellers, qui sont euh, relogés par l'État ou qui ont des facilités pour être euh, euh, relogés dans des habitations décentes. Ça s'appelle le programme Ville sans bidonville, VSB. Euh... Alors, Fogarim. C'est le principal fonds de garantie, donc celui qui sert un peu de référence, comme je disais, dans, 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 à cause de son succès qui est quand même assez intéressant. Euh, il y a trois fonds de garantie. En dehors de Fogarim, l'autre fonds de garantie intéressant s'appelle le Fogaloge. Et euh, il vise des classes un peu, plus, un peu plus aisées, donc plus les classes moyennes que Fogarim. Euh, mais le, le, la partie intéressante, c'est qu'il donne des garanties pour les non-résidents, les Marocains non-résidents, donc la diaspora, euh, ce qui est un, une population qui présente aussi évidemment un certain risque, puisque ce sont des gens qui achètent leur maison dans leur pays natal, mais dont les revenus euh, sont euh, perçus à l'étranger. Je signale simplement ça parce que c'est un, une notion assez intéressante. Alors pour Forgarim lui-même... Euh, les, la cible, donc, ce sont les travailleurs euh, indépendants. Définition de l un, un, de, du secteur informel, c'est une définition générale, c'est euh, les gens qui ne sont pas affiliés au système de sécurité sociale. 
Ça ne veut pas dire forcément que ce, soit, ce sont des, des travailleurs indépendants ou des street traders, ou des, mais il y a aussi des salariés, mais de petites entreprises qui ne sont pas affiliées à la sécurité sociale. Donc là, je donne un peu les paramètres. Je n'insiste pas sur le, le, le calibrage, la définition de la cible. Euh, les normes de prêt, euh, ce qui me paraît un, important, c'est que c'est forcément de l'hypothécaire, euh, que ça va, le taux de, enfin, les quotités, les LTV euh, peuvent aller jusqu'à 100%. Euh, et euh, le, un, un élément intéressant aussi, c'est qu'il y a une exigence de taux fixe. Comme on parle de gens modestes, euh, il est assez important euh, de leur prêter à taux fixe parce que euh, leur revenu ne suffit pas à amortir euh, des, des fluctuations de taux d'intérêt. Voilà, donc euh, <coughs> Fogarim couvre 70% de la, de la créance ou 80% dans le programme VSB des gens ex-bidonvillois. Alors, rapidement, comment ça fonctionne et l'équilibre financier c'est un, un système de garantie avec des primes, ce qui est normal, euh, qui sont plus ou moins liées au risque. Alors le plus ou moins, c'est fondé à nouveau sur la quotité, sur le LTV. Euh, je donne la formule, là, ça, et ça aboutit à des primes de, du style, comme je dis, entre 20 et 50 points de base supplémentaires, en plus des taux d'intérêt. Euh, la garantie peut être mise en jeu après 9 mois d'arriéré, à condition que le prêteur ait déjà entamé la procédure de saisie judiciaire. Euh, le calibrage des fonds propres à l'origine, l'État, euh, comme ça, au doigt mouillé, avait dit on va mettre 12,5% des engagements comme capital. Euh, et en fait, euh, la, le multiplicateur est bien plus élevé maintenant. Euh, L'État a quand même contribué en plusieurs tranches euh, à Fogarim, mais n'a pas suivi complètement son impact. Donc maintenant, le multiplicateur, c'est 35 fois, c'est assez élevé quand même, le, le rapport entre le montant des prêts et la capitalisation du fonds. Dans ce fonds, d'ailleurs, le secteur VSB est plus risqué, donc il y a une sorte d'individualisation du capital pour le programme VSB. Et puis la gestion est assurée par une société d'État, mais qui agit comme simple prestataire de services, donc ce, ce n'est pas à ces risques. C'est un peu en train de changer, mais je n'insiste pas là-dessus. Alors, bref bilan de, de, de Fogarim, c'est un, un mécanisme qui bénéficie à entre 11 et 17 000 prêts par an, c'est-à-dire à peu près 15 de la production au Maroc. Il a bénéficié quand même à un nombre significatif de ménages, 156 000 depuis l'origine. Euh, il y a huit banques qui participent, mais en pratique trois surtout. Euh, bon, il y a un petit graphique là qui montre la production. Euh, il y a eu deux baisses. La première, il y a quelques années, euh, résultait en fait de déboire hein, des premiers prêteurs euh, qui ont levé le pied un peu parce qu'ils ont commencé à subir quand même des pertes euh, euh, assez importantes enfin, sur, euh, sur, sur le secteur. Et puis plus récemment, il y a une baisse, mais c'est un peu tout le marché qui est un peu en diminution. Un des points dommage, enfin, un peu dommage dans l'expérience de Fogarim, c'est qu'il soutient très peu l'autoconstruction, alors que c'est quand même un, dans ce secteur un mode de production très important. Et notamment, alors excusez-moi de faire une petite parenthèse, c'est parce qu'au Maroc, il y a ce système assez intéressant qui s'est développé qui s'appelle le tiers associé. C'est des gens qui sont notamment des ex-bidonvillois qui se mettent en partenariat avec un petit constructeur, un artisan, sur le petit lot que l'État leur a donné, 150 mètres carrés, et ils construisent typiquement une maison à trois étages. Alors le rez-de-chaussée, ça va être leur petit commerce, par exemple. Le premier étage, ça va être leur logement. Et puis le deuxième étage est donné en dation, en paiement, pour le constructeur, pour l'artisan. Et donc, ça, ça évite, c'est une formule qui donne des résultats tout à fait corrects en termes de décence et de qualité de la construction, mais qui évite de recourir au crédit. C'est un peu pour ça que la, 
euh, l'autoconstruction n'apparaît pas tellement dans les statistiques de, de Fogarim. Euh, alors, brièvement, en termes de... Après l'aspect volumétrique, euh, le, le risque, donc vous voyez une statistique, le, le taux d'arriéré global sur les portefeuilles garantis est d'environ 8%, ce qui est un peu supérieur, mais pas... Ce n'est pas un dérapage énorme par rapport à la moyenne générale. Euh, et le cumul des mises en jeu depuis l'origine du système euh, est de, 8 pour, de 7% pardon, euh, des, du total des crédits accordés. Alors les principaux facteurs de risque, euh, premièrement c'est l'ancienneté bancaire, donc euh, les gens qui ne sont pas bancarisés avant d'emprunter, c'est vraiment un risque important, donc il faut absolument exiger 6 euh, mois ou 12 mois d'ancienneté bancaire. Euh, deuxièmement la quotité, ça c'est assez classique. Troisièmement, la localisation. Et enfin, le genre. Les, les, ménages, enfin, les, les femmes emprunteuses sont à peu près euh, un tiers moins risquées que les hommes. <rire> aussi, c est, c est, ça se retrouve assez généralement. Alors, très brièvement, en Tunisie. Euh, donc, ça, c'est quelque chose de très... Bon, oui, juste un, un premier point, un aperçu. De, en Tunisie, le... Il y a assez peu de systèmes d'aide euh, au, au financement du logement. Euh, le principal système est un système de bonification d'intérêts, donc des intérêts réduits euh, par un fonds qui s'appelle le FOPROLOS. Dans FOPROLOS, le S signifie salarié. Donc c'est un système uniquement pour les salariés euh, avec une contribution de 1% des salaires versés par les employeurs. Euh, ce système marche assez mal, il produit vraiment peu de, de résultats. Euh, il y a aussi un système d'épargne logement, également d'ailleurs géré par euh, la Banque de l'Habitat, comme le FOPROLOS, un épargne logement avec un, 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 une, une incitation fiscale. Mais comme la Banque de l'Habitat ne prête qu'aux salariés, encore une fois, c'est toujours euh, des emprunteurs salariés. Or, en Tunisie, il y a à peu près un tiers de la population non agricole qui est dans le secteur informel et qui est non salarié. Euh, donc, non seulement le système pour les salariés marche mal, mais ça laisse de côté une part importante de la population. D'où, en cours, une révision de la politique d'aide au logement en Tunisie et qui se matérialise notamment par la création en cours d'un fonds de garantie. Alors le décret sur ce fonds de garantie vient de sortir au mois de septembre, donc le fonds n'existe pas encore, mais voici ses principales caractéristiques. Euh, là encore, une des conditions, c'est de ne pas être adhérent au système de sécurité sociale. Euh, il faut que ce soit hypothécaire. Euh, c'est un peu théorique, mais enfin, il faut être en règle avec euh, les impôts sur les revenus. En général, euh, ces populations n'en payent pas beaucoup d'impôts. Euh, un truc intéressant... Euh, enfin, c'est comme Fogarim, c'est-à-dire que la procédure judiciaire doit avoir été lancée par, le, par le, le prêteur. Et puis là, il y a une prime qui est 1% flat. Et la couverture est de 70%, je crois, de, de la créance. Le truc intéressant, c'est que, en dehors de la capitalisation et de la prime, il y a une notion de stop-loss par euh, prêteur, c'est-à-dire que le système ne garantira pas euh, une banque qui fait vraiment des... n'importe quoi dans sa production. Voilà. Alors, terminons par quelques euh, idées sur les bonnes pratiques euh, dans ce, en matière de fonds de garantie. Euh, le point central, c'est vraiment que ce soit des systèmes crédibles. Parce que, comme toute assurance, si on a un doute euh, sur euh, la capacité de l'assurance à couvrir une perte, on ne euh, on va pas voir l'assurance. Ça ne sert à rien. Donc, il faut que ce soit pérenne et bien, bien établi financièrement, euh, c'est-à-dire une tarification, ce qui paraît normal, puisque ce sont des risques quand même accrus, donc euh, il y a un, un, un prix me paraît tout à fait normal. Une capitalisation correcte. Alors là, comme je dis, il y a une sorte d'équilibre à trouver, parce que euh, si elle est trop faible, le système n'est pas crédible. Si elle est trop forte, l'État, en général, reprend la capitalisation, ce qui n'est pas non plus souhaitable. Euh, un élément important, à mon sens, puisque ce sont des, des dispositifs à objectif social soutenus par l'État, il faut que l'État euh, euh, enfin, soit, soit clair et net 
que si le, les, le dispositif était depleted, était vidé euh, plus, plus, plus rapidement que prévu, il serait là pour, malgré tout, euh, faire en sorte que les, les engagements soient honorés. Sinon, là encore, euh, la crédibilité du système est en doute. Euh, et le, le, un point très important, c'est que pour euh, calibrer ce genre de système, euh, on, il y a d'abord des paramètres techniques, alors le, le taux de couverture, etc., euh, la prime, mais ce qui est très important, c'est euh, que euh, le contexte est très, très important. Hein, que, quelle est l'historique de, de défaut Est-ce que les hypothèques marchent bien euh, Est-ce que l'État est crédible quand il annonce qu'il va euh, soutenir le fonds Donc le, euh, les facteurs contextuels sont aussi importants que les facteurs techniques. Voilà. Euh, dernière slide très rapidement, c'est qu'il faut faire très attention quand on construit ce genre de fonds de garantie à certains risques. Alors, premier risque classique en assurance, c'est ce qu'on appelle l'aléa morale. C'est-à-dire que le fait d'être couvert par une assurance ou une garantie fait que les gens relâchent leur discipline. Il faut faire très attention à ça. Alors, pour limiter ce risque, il est très important d'avoir des critères de prêt, de, de bonne de, 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 de sain et, et, et prudent. Euh, donc, euh, s'agissant de populations informelles, il est, bien, il est très fortement souhaitable que les prêteurs aient la capacité d'estimer les revenus, bien qu'ils ne soient pas documentés, et aussi d'avoir une sorte d'idée de budget type pour les familles qui empruntent, euh, pour savoir exactement quel, quelle est leur épargne euh, implicitement. Et puis, il y a d'autres éléments, comme par exemple, euh, obliger à avoir une épargne préalable pour voir la capacité des gens à mettre de côté de l'argent avant d'emprunter. Euh, Peut-être, dans certains cas, euh, la demande qu'ils suivent des, des, une sorte de, de formation, d'éducation financière. C'est ce qui se fait au Maroc. Il y a une, une fondation pour l'éducation financière gérée par la Banque centrale. Euh, et donc, ce sont des exemples de normes de prêts euh, euh, importantes. Et dernier point, euh, il faut aussi éviter qu'il y ait des arbitrages. Donc, euh, euh, il ne faut pas que, à risque égal, le transfert des risques se traduise par moins de capitaux euh, de, de couvrant ces risques dans le système. Euh, et puis, il faut éviter également les, les effets d'aubaine, que l'État euh, dépense quelque chose alors que ça marche même quand il n'intervient pas. Voilà, bah écoutez, je crois que c'est... Les... Excusez-moi d'avoir été un peu rapide, mais comme euh, sur la... la présentation, vous aurez... Euh, les, voilà. les Merci de... beaucoup. Ouais. Est-ce qu'on pourrait euh, applaudir, s'il vous plaît Merci. Thank you. I just want to spend uh, a few minutes talking about the informal sector, you know, within the Nigerian context, which we referenced earlier on in the earlier session. Um, Well, everybody knows what uniform underwriting standards are there for, so no need for me to go through that. So I'll just quickly run through the slides and basically focus on this to contextualize the informal sector in Nigeria. Um, as, you, as I mentioned it during, my, uh, during the earlier session, they, it's, it's actually a huge opportunity for mortgage banks within Nigeria, constituting at least 65% of the GDP in Nigeria. A uh, huge employer of labor, uh, statistics are that, um, I can't see very well here, 73.76% uh, of jobs created in Nigeria, created within the informal sector. And what are the contributing factors to the growth of the informal sector in Nigeria? Obviously, urbanization and population growth, major contributors. You know, uh, Projections are that Nigeria's current population of close to 200 million people will eventually rise to 410 million people by 2050. A frightening perspective from my, from my, from my, from my point of view. So urbanization, rural urban migration, uh, and so on, and then high unemployment rates, those are major factors, and I'm sure it's the same kind of uh, features that you find elsewhere in the region. Um, but the important thing is uh, the issue was raised that they, the, the risk 
involved in lending to the informal sector are quite high that they constitute a major disincentive for mortgage banks to actually operate in that sector. But I would argue, you know, to the reverse, that it's actually the mortgage banks who have seen this opportunity and are coming up with various de-risking initiatives to ensure that their operations remain sustainable as they target that sector. Um, I'll just spend a few minutes, you know, uh, highlighting some of these uh, measures to de-risk lending to the sector by referencing the key fundamentals of the underwriting standards for the informal sector that has been developed in the Nigerian market, as I said, uh, NMRC-driven, but also working with uh, key stakeholders like the regulator, the Central Bank of Nigeria, uh, the Federal Mortgage Bank of Nigeria, um, the Nigeria Deposit Insurance Company, and the Mortgage Banking Association of Nigeria. Um, so, what are the credit worthiness uh, features required? The potential borrower must produce documents such as 12-month payment receipts of at least three utility bills, whether it's rent, utility payments, waste, water, phone, and so on. 12 months payments of three of, those, uh, of these bills. A letter of reference from his or her association. I don't know what the situation is here in Cote d'Ivoire, maybe the uh, UMOA region, but in Nigeria you have, for example, a lot of traders belonging to traders' associations market women associations and so on. And those associations are quite strong structures with strong governance mechanism that can provide the guarantee that mortgage banks feel they can rely on in order to provide this loan. So one of the conditionalities for accessing the loan for the informal sector player will be a letter from these kinds of associations guaranteeing, first of all, membership, first of all, that they've been proactive and they've been paying their membership dues regularly. Third is a notarized statement of adequate net worth for the loan program. And then evidence and confirmation of satisfactory payments of dues or subscription uh, to the associate. I've already mentioned that. Sometimes even receipts for uh, payment of school fees are accepted as collateral for that, and then any other informal means as acceptable to the lender. The lender can also determine what other documentation they might need to guarantee the loan. Loan tenor is a um, uh, five to mature minimum of five years and a maximum of 20 years. Um, they must be registered with the PENCOM, with the Pension, with this, uh, pension Commission of Nigeria. It is also an incentive to bring them into the pension fold and also bring them into the, uh, you know, the tax fund because they must produce at least minimum three years of, of uh, tax payment. Um, so we come to the crux of the matter, the equity down payment required. This varies by loan amount. For loans of two million and above, required equity down payment is 35% not the normal 20% that you have in the formal uh, sector. For loans uh, below 2 million, from 1 million 999 to 500,000, minimum down payment required is 25%. And for loans below 500,000 Naira, minimum down payment required is 20%. Now this has generated a, quite a lot of discussions amongst informal sector players when we you know, discuss this with them, when we have a focus group uh, to present these new underwriting standards to them. The feedback, general feedback being that the down payment requires, uh, requirements are quite high and almost impossible to meet. But obviously within the market there are efforts afoot to really enable them to meet these equity down payment requirements. Um, you talked of a mortgage guarantee product. Actually, in Nigeria, we're in the process, we are in the process of developing a mortgage guarantee product based to some extent on the forgotten that you mentioned in Morocco as part of the Nigerian housing finance program. 
it's still very much in the works. But obviously, the whole idea is to help you know, low-income borrowers access this lending at, uh, at affordable rates. Um, and then, payment to income uh, ratio as well as debt to income ratio must, by regulation, should not be above those percentages that I should I just reference. Um, one other conditionality is that the potential borrower must deposit at least three months post-dated checks uh, to the mortgage bank in question and show evidence of an income stream over six months as a preconditionality for accessing the mortgage loan. It must also have registered a BVN, a bank verification number. That is a new, uh, well, it's not really new. It's, it's been introduced within the financial uh, sector in Nigeria as a means of verifying bank accounts so that each bank account owner has a unique identifier, which is being, uh, is being uh, managed by an, an entity called NIPS, uh, Nigeria Interbank System, uh, uh, Nigeria Interbank System uh, Company. And uh, it basically serves to uh, mitigate the fraud and the duplication of, uh, of uh, basically fraud within the banking system in Nigeria. So the requirement is that the potential borrower must have registered a BVN. It's also a, in a, in a, a personal identifier, an ID. Uh, prepayment of the mortgage loan. The mortgage loan can be prepaid before time, uh, but the bank lending institution may charge a penalty fee. A primary requirement for all of this, obviously, is something that has been referenced also previously, that is education, education, education. And education must come beforehand. It is very important that the potential borrower is fully aware of what he or she is getting into. And because you're dealing with the informal sector, where education levels are invariably very low, this education must really target the level of literacy of the potential borrower. Secondly, there must also be in the borrower's, potential borrower's native language or vernacular. So it must be broken down and simplified so that the potential borrower is able to really grasp and understand fully the terms and conditions of, of, uh, of the loan. It's really, really important. And that is part of what the regulator is also looking to, uh, to drive. So these are the, you know, the, some of the... Three more minutes. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering where that was coming. Some of the preconditions that have been put in place by the mortgage bankers themselves in order to enable their sustainable operations within, you know, within the informal sector of the economy. Um, as I said, it's still very much new. Uh, the actual underwriting standards were launched earlier on this year. So implementation has been mainly, you know, we're very much in tentative first steps. Um, we've taken very tentative uh, first steps. Uh, as I mentioned earlier on, we operate in a very nascent uh, mortgage environment. So this is, has actually exacerbated uh, some of the constraints that, that I already mentioned. But the important thing is that they recognize the massive opportunity. And there is excitement within the informal sector about this opportunity to own homes, not through saving you know, or incremental building, but actually through mortgages. Um, again, the, the uh, coming on board of the mortgage guarantee company and of course, intensive and aggressive mortgage literacy education will go towards uh, the sustainable implementation of the underwriting standards for the informal sector. So that's what is going on within the Nigerian uh, uh, mortgage uh, ecosystem as far as informal sector lending is concerned. Thank you. So, so we'll take just one question for each. So who has a question for Mr. 
for, 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 for Jarim. No question? Thank you. Uh, and who was a question for... Uh, ah, there's one question for Mr... No, who has a question for Doctor? Uh, my name is Paris from FSD Africa. My question to Dr. Chi is uh, uh, the role of insurance in, uh, is it bundled uh, in this product for the low income earners? And secondly, are there saving schemes? Save one question. Oh, it's a continuation. Go ahead, go ahead, it's go a ahead. continuation. Uh, is there, uh, are there saving schemes specifically aimed at uh, encouraging the informal sector to save towards the down payment? Yeah, those are very good questions. Uh, the mortgage guarantee product obviously will incorporate some form of insurance mechanism because the insurance company will guarantee you know, the, the rest of the balance of the down payment for the equity that is required. Before even the mortgage guarantee comes on stream, we have operational now a product that had been referenced earlier on in the morning session. That's the collateral replacement indemnity insurance. That is fully operational in the Nigerian market right now. Uh, we have some insurance companies that have already signed up to that, and they are providing that service to potential borrowers, so primarily in the formal sector. They haven't really moved downstream to the informal sector. And uh, to your second question, whether saving schemes are encouraged, that's you know, very much so, because um, I mentioned the trade associations, and which could also be called cooperatives, quote unquote. You know, so those are mechanisms you know, whereby that provide the support as well as the structure that incentivizes the mortgage banks to now provide loans to operators within the informal sector. So there is a very strong uh, saving scheme in place, especially within the structures of the trade associations, uh, whether it be motor mechanics, market women, what have you. Thank you very much. Please give them a round of applause. Uh, so we are 30 minutes late, so now it's uh, lunchtime. Uh, we'll start again at 1.40 meaning that 10, 10 minutes after. So, 40 minutes pour manger. Merci à tout à l'heure. Nous reprendrons vraiment à l'heure. We'll, we'll start at 1.40. Thank you in advance. Up in 2008. Where we're at in the country right now, they're on the second financial sector charter, where now the banks have come back and said, for the 8 billion, we'd like to put it out. Half of that, it will be just for affordable housing. We want to partner with you. It's not just a giveaway money. We want to make sure that as we put the money in, actually, uh, we are making a return of that. But now, I think what is important, which I've been, what, what I've been asked to do is, what has been our experiences as a state, uh, because we're wholly owned um, DFI by government. Initially, the conception was we were supposed to be a PPP, because in the first five years, private sector took uh, almost um, convertible preference shares into the NHFC for five years, which were convertible to, uh, to shares. And after five years, they realized that they were earning more from the shares than preference shares than they would if they took, or they took a shareholding. And when five years elapsed, they came back and said, no, 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 we don't want to convert. Just let's stay as we are. You pay us double-digit interest rates. And uh, obviously, you know, in government, being government, government said if that is the case, we pull the, pl we pull, we pull the carpet under your feet. And so that's why the it, NHFC ended up being a wholly owned state entity. Our experiences, just briefly, the first five years of our operation, someone said here as we're giving a presentation, we made certain assumptions. And the assumptions that were made in the housing fora was that there is this unsaved segment of the market that needed to be funded, and there are intermediaries who are ready to do the lending. But when we started business, we realized there were not sufficient retail intermediaries throughout the whole country. And that ended up us now beginning to almost support some of them emerging startups to make sure that they come to a place where they can take loans. First five years, key instrument was incremental housing. And, and that's the instrument that drove uh, the business of the NHFC. At the same time, uh, two years after uh, establishment, which is in 1998, we piloted the social housing uh, financing in the country. 
Now, I can you know, uh, boast um, about the fact that social housing in the country, we funded it until now in 2014. That's when the banks began to say, at least uh, you have created confidence and would like to come into that. And social housing is where about 75% is subsidized and the top up, which is the 25%, is the loan component. And now only then that, uh, based on the confidence that you have created in the market that the private sector is coming in. As for uh, the incremental housing, because of our uh, wholesale financing of retail intermediaries in this sector, what happened was we had a, a rapid growth in the incremental housing uh, market. And part of that was for consumption purposes, but mainly we channeled that to housing, which is incremental. And some of those were linked to um, some of the building material suppliers through which they were able to deliver uh, either cement or bricks, especially in the rural and deep rural areas. Now, because of the growth of that, we realized that this market needed to be regulated. Actually, one of the things we did, we facilitated the creation of regulation, especially for the unsecured loan market. Uh, initially, today is the national uh, um, NCR today, and before that, it was uh, um, microfinance regulatory authority that we helped set up to make sure that the industry is actually regulated. And um, I've been asked to say, what impact have you made? In 2003, um, what we did is we begin to partner with private sector. In fact, let me say our modus operandi as the NHFC is always one scale, we, we said, belongs to private sector. And innovation belongs to private sector. Our job is to catalyze that. And by using blended funding, which is really the role that we played significantly as the NHFC. One, we made sure that the delivery was more than what was already available in the marketplace. Otherwise, concessionality does not translate to additionality until you, the delivery is more than what was available there. Secondly, uh, through our interventions, we move banks to places where they would not otherwise go, market development, which is another great area where, like, for instance, I made an example about social housing, that uh, only now that the banks are coming through to finance it and, and seeing it as a sustainable venture. But also, um, through our concessionality, we were able to make sure that we bring viability of our clients because to us, commercial viability of our clients is very significant because over time, we don't want them to rely on government on an ending basis. So initially, we put in our money, but later on, we withdraw it until they come to a place where they mature and graduate and be funded by banks or capital markets. Now, in that case, uh, for us, we lose revenue in terms of in interest income but we gain from uh, developmental impact, which is really the purpose for which we are set up as, as the NHFC. But I think a success story which I'd like to share with you is on the private rental and inner city market financing. Now, we conceived together with a private partner setting up of an organization called Trust for Urban Housing Finance, which is tough. And we financed inner city uh, uh, development. Firstly, it was in Johannesburg, but later on we made sure that we invited other private sector players, banks, um, asset managers, and pension funds to participate with us because at the time we put in our 10 million as equity into the entity and 50 million the first loan. And by today as we speak, the same entity 15 years later, is, is worth 2.7 billion rands balance sheet. And it's doing financing of inner city redevelopment at the moment in five of the nine provinces in the country. And it's profitable and we're earning an income on that. So our thrust is always that we're here as a state-owned entity to catalyze what private sector can do, but also to lead it into areas where it, on itself it would not go. So let me pause the maybe um, I'll take questions. So thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting uh, story. I'd like to hear more now from uh, Joseph on the Zambian case as well. Th 
Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, I was hoping you'd skip me, go first with, <laughs> so I need to prepare my notes. Yeah, we, we are a building society, uh, as I'm a national.